Greetings once again. This is Dr. Jonathan Ellerby, and this is the 12 at 12, our daily live uh, Facebook quick dive into what? Spirituality, the meaning of life, uh, what it means to be human, and all that in the middle of a pandemic. And we have been talking about uh, death, dying, and letting go all this week different shades of the same topic. If you are watching this live or or uh, soon after it's recorded, don't forget Sunday, Easter Sunday at 10:30 a.m. Mountain Time USA at the Althea Center Denver Facebook page, we are doing a live Easter service. Uh, we're hoping to have uh, the lead singer, Wendy, from the Queen City Jazz Band. I will be doing the message and prayers. And we will be looking at the universal lessons for people of all walks of life and all belief systems that come from the life, the lessons, and the legacy of Jesus. How he prepared us for this very moment that we're in and how to make it something transformative, healing, and for the good of all. So definitely check that out. Also, stay tuned. If you don't know, I have written a bunch of books. I'm actually going to read you an excerpt from one here, Return to the Sacred, and uh, I, it shows up backwards on Facebook. I don't know why. And uh, I have a new book coming out on spiritual experience. So make sure you're following me on Facebook and check out my newsletter, uh, website, all that kind of stuff, because I'm giving it out for free. Free. All right, without any further delays, it's time, it's time. So let's take a deep breath. Let's slow down and settle down. And even if your day is quiet, you can always take a still moment just to listen to the quietness, just to feel the stillness and the silence inside you and notice the way we can slow our energy down even amid boredom and emptiness the mind can speed us up the emotions can speed us up but stillness brings us back to spirit and feel your body relax the muscles in your face relax. And simply letting the words and images of this poem blossom naturally inside you. It began so innocently was it a taste, a glimpse, a fragrance on the wind? Somewhere, somehow, we were touched by something truly sacred. It was beauty and bliss, the most intoxicating essence. It was a knowing so complete, a peace so unbelievable, and it drove us into an extraordinary madness, forsaking everything. Not death, nor the breaking of this fragile body, nor the loss of family or friend mattered. There was nothing left for us in this world without it. The haunting call was constant in sleep, dream, and waking. It drove us from our lives, and we took refuge in the temple found solace in the high caves and cliffs. We lay at the feet of your doorways, burned days and nights like old paper. We gave it all until there was nothing left but the only thing there is. So when you are ready, you can open your eyes and return. This is actually a poem that I wrote. And it was in the book Return to the Sacred at the beginning of the last section. And in Return to the Sacred, I'm talking about the, the 12 most common, powerful, universal spiritual practices that we find around the world. 
and they're organized in, in general categories, so it's not like yoga or centering prayer specifically. It's more like movement, music, meditation, prayer. And, there's, uh, and then they're organized into four areas of orientation. Mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual. In other words, the 12 universal paths and practices really rely on or are rooted in one of each of these four areas of self, even though, of course, we are always all four. The last area we talk about is the spirit-centered practices, the practices that are really about stripping away everything, everything, even mind and emotion and body. And the three practices we talk about are the ascetic practices. So we've talked about that a little bit here in some of my other online programs as well. Those are practices that are really oriented around doing without, you know, uh, fasting of different kinds, solitude of different kind. The life practice, which is about making every single experience and moment, every single experience and moment, your practice and your work. And then there's a chapter on the death practice. And the death practice is incredibly significant for this week and uh, the themes that we've been covering together. The death practice is uh, classically about uh, traditions and roles in spiritual communities in which you place yourself in direct relationship to actual death. So that might mean uh, in the Jewish tradition there was a special rabbinic uh, tradition of preparing the bodies and making prayers for those passing or past. You know, in Hinduism, there is the tradition of preparing the rites and rituals at the burning guts. So to cremate the bodies and to conduct the ceremony and live in close relationship with those bodies. And so it goes on and on in all the traditions that there are roles and practices that relate directly to placing ourselves in close relationship with real, physical, human death. For a lot of people today, that seems morose, macabre, and kind of disgusting. For most of us, we have grown up in a world where death has been sanitized. Death has been removed from our lives. As children, we're generally not introduced to it or taken to funerals, or it's explained in very general terms. Um, even when someone passes, especially if it's at home, uh, very quickly, the you know uh, medical examiner or, or, or the funeral home is called and they are taken away. And the next time you see them, they have either been cremated and it's their ashes, or they have been prepared and embalmed and now it's their, their sanitized body. But we spend very little time being with death. In fact, in my years of experience as a counselor, a coach, and even early on as a chaplain, what I found in being with people uh, who were dying and with the families afterwards was uh, I was struck by how little most people were prepared for something that absolutely everyone's going to do and something that absolutely everyone's going to experience. We're all going to lose loved ones and we are all going to die. But talking about it, facing it, being comfortable with it is something that is typically not done in the modern world today. More than that, what I found is that as people have lost loved ones, too often the next thing that follows is their own abandonment. That because their friends and even family don't know how to handle all the emotions, the tension, the stress, the, the, the fear of mortality that arises through the direct experience of death, it is an incredibly common time for people to lose friends and loved ones. And I don't mean to death, I mean to the fear of death. And so taking time while we go through this crisis, this worldwide um, um, transformation, it's critical that we open our hearts and minds to explore how we think of death, 
how we feel about death, to review our stories and experiences of death. Maybe they haven't been good ones, but does that mean the next experiences will be? And what are the assumptions we have about death? Do we think of it as a failure or a loss? Or do we, do we reconnect with our core spiritual beliefs and remember that death is only a transition? That the truth of those we love and ourselves is that we are something that transcends death. Consciousness, energy, soul, spirit, whatever you want to call it, it precedes the human experience. It endures and witnesses the human incarnation. And it continues when we leave. If you have been around many people at the time of passing, as I have, then you know, you know for yourself from experience, there is something inexplicable, something strangely magical about the final days and hours of life. We can actually feel people's energy body moving in and out of their physical body. We can see the way the body loses its luster as the soul moves out and observes the room, the situation, the transition, and comes back in. If you have worked in medical settings, if you are working in medical settings, you know, you know that even though it was never taught in nursing or med school, you know that around the time of death, there are always inexplicable phenomena. People coming out of comas just to say goodbye to someone who showed up unexpectedly. People who, who we, we are certain that they should have died, but they, they live and live and live until that last relative can come. People who talk about seeing family members, loved ones who have already passed, coming into the room and preparing them, being ready to greet them on the other side. The point of this is to say that death is a metaphysical transition. It is not an end to anything that ultimately matters. Now, is it painful because we lose our familiar relationship with the body and the life we know? Of course. Can it feel tragic and traumatic because we aren't ready for someone to go or we aren't ready for the manner in which we go? Of course, of course. And we can't minimize or take that pain away from people. But we also don't do a service in this world when we disconnect from the truth of death. Right now, millions of people are grappling with the death of tens of thousands of people. And in some communities alone, like in Italy, in Spain, in New York, in just these small communities, Tens of thousands of people have now passed in a very short space of time. And for many of us, it's easier to ignore it, to not feel it too directly, to not read the numbers or the stories of those people grieving. We don't want to make it too real. We don't want to have that fear in our own lives. But death is a part of life. And if we walk through the forest, if we walk through the park, if we have a plant on our balcony, or we have uh, animals in our lives, or if we've been alive long enough, we know that in time, everything dies. And in that way, makes space for that which comes next. And so we remember the three channels of life, the conditional, the essential, and the universal. And we recognize that our attitude to death changes with each channel that we watch. The conditional channel of life wants everything under control the way we prefer it, wants uh, to judge that which we don't like, and feels tremendous pain and belief that important things can be lost, stolen, or taken away. But that's because the conditional self is oriented around that which is temporary. The essential self looks to the lessons of death. No matter what the pain is, no matter what the loss is, what is this other soul's passage inviting me to consider? If tens of thousands of people have died today, 
What am I going to learn from that? What am I going to uh, do differently in my life because of that? How am I going to honor and dignify each of those passages by finding lesson and love and wisdom through them? And finally, as I tune into the universal channel, the channel of spirit, I remember that death is part of the very design of our existence. And not just in the physical sense, but even in the emotional and the personal sense. That there was a time we were children and that part of ourselves had to die to the teenage self, which had to die to the young adult, which had to die to the adult. We've been through divorces and businesses and jobs and degrees and all these things that bring us life and fulfillment also, also require letting go, loss and death, the death of a role, the death of a relationship, the death of a job. And so we move forward through death and its creative force and power. It's a lot to hold and a lot to think about, but I encourage you to embrace it, to not be afraid of it, to take it in doses, and to be willing to sit with it and see the way your different levels of self and life relate to this absolutely essential human experience and condition. And so with that, we have to close. Our 12 at 12 is already you know, 16 at 12. So let's take a breath. Close your eyes. And let's return once again to Rilke and the power of life that transcends death, the power of life that lives at the center of us in his poem, Gravity. Center. How from all beings you pull yourself even from those that fly, winning yourself back, irresistible center. He who stands as a drink through thirst, gravity plunges down through him. But from the sleeper falls, as though from a motionless cloud, the abundant rain of the heavy. It's a lot in a few words, but we are lost when we are attached to all the conditional temporary distractions of life, and we are awake and fully alive when we find that center point that does not die. It allows us to look into the pain and losses of life and find beauty, hold sorrow, and live with patience and wisdom. So thank you. I think, I think maybe today was an important message. Please feel free to share it and please join me again. Love you. Enjoy the worldwide wake up as best you can.